Very interesting uh, lecture by Professor Richard Molika. It's really a great honor for me to introduce uh, such a great man who has done beautiful work all over the world. I'll just give a brief introduction about uh, who Professor Molika is. He's the director of the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma at the Harvard Medical School. He, he received his medical degree from the University of New Mexico and completed his psych psychiatry residency at Yale Medical School. While at Yale, he also trained in epidemiology and received a philosophy degree from the Divinity School. In 1981, Dr. Molika co-founded the Indochinese Psychiatry Clinic with James Lavelle. For more than three decades, Dr. Molika and his team have pioneered the mental health care for survivors of mass violence and tortures. HPRT's clinical model has been replicated throughout the world. Through his team's research, clinical work, and education efforts, Dr. Molika is recognized as a leader in the treatment and rehabilitation of traumatized people and their communities. Dr. Molika strongly believes in a holistic, integrated primary care approach to the pain and suffering of people who have been exposed to violence and continues to promote a multidisciplinary approach to every community in which he works. He often looks at a human trauma and says, this is a hopeless situation, but not, not an impossible one. Currently, Dr. Mulika is very interested in improving the healing environment for refugees and displaced people, so that when people reach a place of safety, they're able to recover from their invisible wounds. Um, I just have to acknowledge all the people who've been heavily involved with us uh, for in this intensive week of meetings and field visits which are from the HPRT team, Professor Molika, James Lavelle, Noor Amawi, and Megan Diamond, from the Ministry of uh, Health, His Excellency, uh, Mr. Wael Abu Faour, Doctor, uh, the Director General of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Walid Ammar, and the Head of the Mental Health Program at the Ministry, Dr. Rabi Ashamai. From the medical school at ABMC, Professor Kamal Badr, Professor Ghassan Ahmede, Dr. Nicholas Batley, Dr. Muna Osman Al Haj, and Dr. Zakia Dimasi. From the psychology department, uh, Professor Char Halib, Professor Tony Hoffman, Professor Nidal Dao, and Professor Ala Hijazi. And from the organizations that we visited during our site visits in Biqa'a, uh, Joe and Maria from Beyond, and from Kayani, Madame Jumblat, and her beautiful team, Lamia, Basma, and the rest. And from the Center for Civic Engagement, I, I don't have uh, much word to, to say about them because they've, they've really been doing great efforts and work, and especially in this past week, Brooke, Karen, Hala, Rabi, Ali, and each one of us. So I, um, I will end with, uh, with a quote that uh, I took, I plagiarized from Richard last night. And we were discussing about the role or the significance of uh, the enlightened scholars or academia. And he ends with uh, three st strategic words for me, which is about combining science, experience, and imagination. I hope by the end of this lecture, uh, Richard will be able to widen our imagination, like he's done basically with me, and enable us with, uh, give us some uh, insight about the beautiful work that him and his team has done, which is very much relevant to the uh, crises uh, that we're facing uh, lately in Lebanon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh Can you hear me, or is this my, can I stand up, or do I have to? Okay, good. First of all, it's a great honor to be here in Lebanon. What a magnificent country. You know I'm gonna say this, but I mean it. What a magnificent country, and um, I've been really, really impressed. He wants me to sit down, okay. But I can still move my hands, so it's good. Uh, what a magnificent country. Uh, as an American, Italian-American, the first thing you're impressed by is the beautiful diversity in this country. It, what an incredibly diverse historical country, and uh, I, I, our team has been really impressed by that. And of course, the uh, incredible hospitality 
of the, Les uh, the Lebanese community we've been with, whether in the Becca Valley or here in Beirut, or et cetera. So I want to thank Rabia and his team uh, for their tremendous hospitality. Uh, American University, a great, great university, beautiful. I haven't gone swimming off the, on the beach yet, but I'm planning to tomorrow, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, just a couple things before I begin is I want to thank my team, Jim Lavelle. Stand up, Jim is the co founder of H Pair Team. Uh, uh, our, our team has been together 35 years. Can you imagine that? 35 years? That's a long teamwork, right? Uh, Dr. Nora Maui, who's uh, our project manager. In, uh, in the Middle East, and uh, 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 Megan Diamond, who's our project manager in, in, at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, without a team, I mean, you say this here, without a team, you're nothing, really, right? I mean, we, we don't believe in our group in a one-man, one-woman show, because teamwork is very important, you know. Uh, so I want to... Um, have a little reflection before, first of all, let me ask another question. How many people here are students uh, or are, oh, this is a fantastic, this, that, no, this is, so my lecture is really geared, uh, there'll be no tables, no quotes of research, although I will quote them, but there's not, this is more of a conceptual lecture coming out of 35 years of work. And I'll explain this in a minute. But first I want to begin with a little little story. We always have to begin with a little story. I think Rabia will appreciate it. Is, so I, I was a consultant to the Italian government. I've been a consultant to the Italian government for years, right? And you know, they had a great psychiatric reform where they closed all the mental hospitals in Italy. They just said, let's do away with them. They can't work, we're closing them down. And then they asked me as a young doctor to evaluate this. Evaluate this huge thing, you know. So there was a great, great, old, old, wonderful uh, Italian psychiatrist in Naples who had decided to live with the mentally ill people who had lived in the mental hospital for 20 years. You understand what I'm saying? Because they closed the hospital. Where were they going to go? So he started a day hospital. He said, this is our home. Let's live together, right? His name was Professor Ser Sergio Piero, and he had a lot of influence on me. So one day I was in northern Italy. I was the only American there. They were all Italians, you know, and I was the only Italian American there. And so uh, Sergio Piero comes up to the slide. He comes up to the stage. He has his slides. And he walks over and he goes, oh, like this. And he throws all his slides across the room because he tripped. And all his slides, you know, those are the days of slides, no PowerPoints, right? So all his slides broke. I'm sitting there. I'm the only American. There's like 100 Italians there, right? Professors, right? I go, what is he going to do? His slides are all broken. So he gets up and he goes, the complexity of the complexity. He gets and sits down, and then all hundred doctors get up and they give him a cheering ovation for 20 minutes. You understand? They go, wow, this is the best lecture I ever heard. It was unbelievable. This lecture was fantastic. And I'm going, the complexity of the complexity. What the hell is this guy talking about? What is he talking about? The complexity of the complexity. That's his whole lecture? So I want to tell you the complexity of complexity is what we're dealing with when we're dealing with refugees, right? And that's it, my lecture's over. No, I'll continue, okay. This is a true story, by the way. And to this day, I've never forgotten that lecture. That <laughs> probably is the best lecture a Harvard, I've ever heard at Harvard or anywhere. Because he summarized in one statement the state of the mental hospital and the revolution of Italian psychiatry. And I think we, Rabia and I, we've talked about this, the complexity of the complexity. I mean, sometimes things are so complex, you can't understand them. You ever have this in Lebanon, you know, things get complex and you... Uh, no, right? No, no, I don't have this, right? And also, another one of my friends calls this the enormity problem. You know the enormity problem? Okay, enormity problem goes like this. Uh, 
I, my two sons, my two boys, I'll, I'll start talking. They go, Dad, what about global warming? You know, in 20 years, there's not going to be any planet left. All the, you know, and, and they go on and on. And they're talking about global, you ever have these discussions about global, you know, and, and all of a sudden, I see myself starting to go unconscious, right? I go, they said, Dad, wake up, wake up. I said, wow, what are you guys talking about? They said, well, you know, we got the refugee crisis, 65 million people, we got people hurting each other, we got the, the global warming. I said, look, my brain can't deal with this. This is the enormity problem, right? So I said, how do we deal as young people, right? We're young people, right? Yeah, right. You guys know about the refugee crisis. You have half your country is full of refugees and this and that, uh, global warming and this and that, you know. And so with the enormity problem, it's important not to feel hopeless. How do we not feel hopeless? By taking little pieces of the problem and in your life trying to overcome those little pieces. You understand? If anybody in this room said, yeah, I'm taking on global warming, we'd probably have to hospitalize them, right? Because they'd be delusional, right? But if they say, you know, I'm going to devote my life to chipping away at this problem, and I'm going to try to make contribution. Now, we had, I'm saying this for the young people here, we had a great anthropologist, American anthropologist, Margaret Mead, who, you know Margaret Mead, right, who said, small group of committed people can change the world. You know that saying? A small, he, a small group of committed people can change the world. Isn't that beautiful? And our little team has been a small team, and you have a team here with Rabia that's really doing revolutionary work. Small group of committed people with passion, doing unbelievable work, and I want to talk about that. Is that okay? So I'm going to try to talk for about 45 minutes and then open it up for a discussion because We'd rather have a discussion with the young people here than just talk and talk and talk, you know. Is that okay? Is that okay? He says it's okay, okay, good. So we're gonna, we're gonna open it up, okay. So let's go to the new H5 model. Where did this come from? So we've been in the field 35 years. We've uh, dealt with uh, mass violence and extreme violence in many countries. Uh, Jim and our group and our team in Boston treated over 10,000 survivors of torture in, Bo in Boston. We now have a lot of people coming from Iraq and Afghanistan, etc., who've been violated, you know. And, and um, so we've had um, a major role in many policy situations, like in Peru, Cambod we've been in Cambodia 26 years, you know, Bosnia, people, anyone here been to Sarajevo? By, yeah, you've been, yeah, Sarajevo, where the, the Bosnian Muslims were in conflict with the Croat Catholics and the Serbian Orthodox, you know. We were there 10 years and helped work on that situation with the Ministry of Health. So, so I want to talk to you a little bit about a different model of policy. Now, this model I think you're going to like, because for young people, they like it, because this is a bottom-up policy. You know what I mean by bottom-up? This is a policy that comes from the level of the experience of the people, the people themselves. It doesn't come out of Geneva. It doesn't come out of the UN. It doesn't come from the White House. It comes from the people themselves, bottom-up policy. And bottom-up policy is rare. We have people in Lebanon making decisions about refugees in Geneva. You know that. We all know this. I won't mention the name of the organization, but you know what I'm talking about. People making policy top down. We're really not knowing the culture, the people, the experience, the humanity of the people suffering. Our group is the opposite. We try to bring policy from the bottom up. Now, there were four, four or five top-down policies for refugees. One is, uh, was the uh, Our Global Health Action Plan, which I'm not going to tell you about. 
Now there was Derek Silov who wrote about ADAPT. They have to just tell you that, so Derek Silov in Australia had this ADAPT model about um, safety, security, et cetera. Then the WHO used our model and came up with the mental health gap. It's another WHO top-down policy. And uh, it was something about these policies, you know, in this situation, refugees, you should do this and you should do that, and mental health should be done this way and you should do it this way, but it's all from a top-down level, you know. So um, about five years ago, I had an opportunity to write a chapter in a book about this. I said, let's try to think about this in a different way. What is the policy you would have coming from the experience of the refugees themselves? Now, you know the 65 million refugees, they're in many countries, there's some have been in uh, confinement for over 40 years, the Palestinians, I said, you know, so it, it's a long story. It's not, you know, and you can't just say, well, policy for one group is for Kenya, for Sudan, for Somali, you know, it's, it's diverse, you know, the Syrian refugees now, you know. But I want you to think about these five elements. And then I want to talk about the GATA project at the end that incorporates one of these main elements. Is that okay? Can we work our way through? Okay. So this H5 model has really caught on people in the field at the NGO level, other levels. They like it because you'll see why in a minute, because it's bottom up. It's from the experience of the people. Next slide here. Here it is. So if you look at this model, at the center of the model is the trauma story. Anyone want to comment on it? Does that make sense? That at the center of a refugee's life is the trauma story? Now when I talk about the trauma story, I don't mean just violence. There's a trauma story is a very interesting, wonderful, uh, holistic way of thinking about a narrative, a person's narrative, okay? We, in our group, put the trauma story at the top of the list for the medical and the psychiatric evaluation. I have a flash drive here I'm gonna to give to the primary care doctors. You know, the trauma story is the centerpiece of all medical care. You lose your home. Your father's murdered. You come into a foreign country. You live in a tent. Is there a trauma story there? You know? You have nothing. You've lost everything. You've been sexually violated. Is there a trauma story there? Now, I want to talk about the trauma story forms the centrality of all we do in medicine at a policy level and mental health. Do the people understand where I'm going with this? Okay. Now, there are five elements that circulate around the trauma story from the ground up experience. The first element is human rights. The second element is humiliation. The third element, I wrote a lot about this in my book. If anyone's interested, I can, you can look at my book called uh, Healing Invisible Wounds. It's called Self-Care, People Healing Themselves. How many people here think that highly traumatized people heal themselves? Yeah, I mean, people who have been hurt go through a process of self-healing through their spirituality, their community, etc. right? Health promotion, promoting wellness in people who have been hurt and traumatized. And then there would be a, the GATA project model, habitat and housing. Where do people live? What kind of environment they live in? You see, this is a bottom-up model. Like, we really care where people live. What is it like to live in a tent for four years? What is it like to live with 10 people in a tent for four years? What is it like to be a four-year-old growing up in a tent for four years? You understand what I'm saying? That's a bottom-up policy. The policy maker in Geneva is not thinking about this. I can tell you, you know, and this is, this man is, and his team is, his wonderful team, but the policy maker in Geneva is not thinking about this. So now the next slide. Now, what are the elements? I've written a lot about this because I'm it's, uh, obsessed with this idea of the trauma story. I, I can't, uh, I, there's a long history to why, I was one of the first ones to use the word trauma story back in 1988. 
Because it just dawned on me, you know, people have a narrative, medical narrative. This is a medical narrative, you know. Now, a trauma story for the medical doctors here isn't just about violence. It's also about breast cancer. It's about every, you know, people have been hurt by illness also have a medical narrative, right? We call it a medical narrative, right? So I want to teach you something to think about when you listen to people's stories. Okay, these are the four elements we discovered. I won't go into how we discovered them and the you know, hundreds of hours. Did anyone here do oral histories, for instance? Oral histories, we have, yeah. They're wonderful, right? I mean, oral, everybody in this room is gonna become an oral historian after this lecture. And you're gonna go home and you're gonna sit down with your grandmother and grandfather, and you're gonna say, hey, you know, I just heard a story from a doctor. I'd like to know your history. How many people have done it with their grandparents? Do it, you have to do it. And I'm not talking about trauma story, I'm just saying, wouldn't it be lovely to know the history of your own grandparents? I didn't do it with my mother and father, so they died and I don't know anything about their history, really. I know what they told me, but I don't know oral history. So an oral history, this, all this is based on oral, oral history. People telling narratives about their lives, you know. So wonderful. Doing oral histories. I have, um, we have kids in elementary school doing oral histories with their parents and stuff, you know. It's a wa wonderful to listen to people's stories. Doesn't have to be a trauma story. It's wonderful. Okay, now there are four elements to the trauma story I want to teach you for refugees. First element is the factual accounting of events. In other words, people will tell you the facts, right? They'll say, I was in this town in Syria, the bombing, and this is what happened. Just facts, right? They tell you the facts, right? Now, in telling you these facts, they're anthropologists. They can only tell you the fact out of their culture. You see what I'm saying? So if an Italian-American woman like my mother tells a story, it's an Italian story out of her culture. It can't be a Lebanese story, right? It can't be a Mexican story. So everybody in the room tells a story out of their own culture. This is beautiful when you understand that people in telling their story are letting them you into their culture. They're teaching you about, like when I first interviewed Cambodian women for 10 years, we did these big old histories. I kept on hearing about arranged marriages, you know. I had no idea what arranged marriage was. And then after 10 years, I finally understood. You know. In fact, my colleague them had an arranged marriage herself. Because you didn't know anything about arranged marriage. I said, I never heard of arranged marriage. Then she explained how an elephant came. She didn't know her husband until the day of the wedding. Then they brought in elephants and they went down the street. And it is a great story. She had never met the guy until the day of the marriage. This came out of the oral history scene. This would not be my mother's story. Dying story scene, right? Cambodian story of arranged marriage, right? It's a beautiful story. I had all these stories of a princess and it was great. Now looking behind the curtain, you'll appreciate, is when everything you believe in is destroyed, you're hurt. You believe in justice, people hurt your family. You believe in a normal life, people destroy your town. That's not normal. Not for the average human being, right? Anywhere in the world, right? So when you go through this, you, we say, lose the world. You lose your world. Your world has disappeared. You're, you don't go, wow, this world, what kind of world is this? I, I can't believe I live in this world. You know, it's not the world my mother and father taught me, you know, right? And then you look behind the curtain and you see new things. This is from, a, this was from a Christian, a very famous Christian writer called Thomas Merton, who talked about prayer. And I'm not just talking about Catholic prayer. I'm also talking about the Quran because a lot of my patients use the Quran for meditation, etc. They find new ideas looking behind the curtain. Saying, you understand? They see something new. Every traumatized person comes up with new wisdom, almost everyone. They're wise people. They see the world in a different way. They're forced to. 
Now, how many people here would elect to be heard in order to become wise? Anybody? Yeah, does one, does one he, he would, yeah, okay, good. Very few people raised their hand and said, you know, I'd like to go through, I'd like to be hurt and get, go through violence so I can become wise, right? None of my patients, the thousands I've seen you know, over 10, 35 years, none of them said that. On the other hand, they come out the other side, wise, smart, know new things, full of life, full of new ideas. This is what we call in science uh, post-traumatic growth. You ever hear this term, post-traumatic growth? Trauma leads to growth. And in many legends, you know, the ancient legends of your culture, the hero at the end comes to some wisdom if the tragedy, right? No? Tragedy leads to wisdom, always. Then finally, this is important, is the storyteller listener relationship. So this young man here is talking to a patient. All of a sudden, he becomes part of her story. She goes home at night and says, you know, my doctor, you know, I, something was wrong with my doctor today. He, he was off. You know, do you know that patients talk about you all the time at home? You know that? You think you just seen a patient take home as the end of it. My grandfather used to laugh all the time because he said, Oh, my primary care doctor died. It was the fifth one. He was like 95 when he died. He says, what's wrong with these guys? They're overweight. They smoke and always dying, you know. So he's always talking about his doctors in a negative way, you know. I didn't like it, but, you know. So what I'm trying, and I have some beautiful stories of patients in California telling their niece about me, who I met 20 years later at Harvard, and said, I've already, I've always known you. I said, how's that possible? I just met you. Because because my, my uncle, who was a torture survivor, you treated him for 20 years. He loved you, and he talked about you every day in California. I was so proud. This was the proudest moment of my life, you know. So you become part of the story of people. Does that make sense? Every listener becomes part of that story. It's beautiful, isn't it? When you think about it, that you're entering into these stories, you become part of the story. So now let's go through the H5 model and then we'll have plenty of time. Okay. Why is it that with 65 million refugees, we don't know anything that happened to them? Do you know that no one collects the human rights history of a refugee when they cross into a camp? Did you know that? Strange, isn't it? My father's murdered. My sister's raped. My town's destroyed. I'm a little boy going through. No one asked me. What happened? I find this shocking, unbelievable, and reprehensible. I do not agree with this policy. That's why these criminals are not being brought to trial. We have no data. I talked to someone at the State Department in charge of this. He says, we're just beginning to do this. I said, 50 years later, you're just beginning to ask refugees what happened to them? Is there a problem here? There's something wrong with this, no? Because all acts of violence are human rights violations, from my point of view. Every act of violence is a human rights violation. And how many people have read the UN Declaration of Human Rights? Yeah, we have some. And we, who's the professors here? Let's hand out the UN Declaration. The UN Declaration, in my, my point of view, is one of the greatest documents that humanity has ever created. And it was created by accident, you know, created at the end of World War II. They all came together and said, let's vote in this, you know. We'll never have that again, probably. I think you should all look at the UN Declaration for Human Rights. It's fantastic. It's something our civilization is built on, should be built on. I would recommend, I have all my medical doctors read the UN Dec Declaration for you. I used to carry it around in my pocket with Marcus Aurelius, but that's another story. So the next slide. Okay. So uh, now humiliation. Let's talk about humiliation. This, did you know that Freud, you know Freud is, right, the great psychologist, never mentioned the word humiliation once in all his writings, thousands of pages of writings. 
And I discovered this. I said, you know, underneath the depression and the anger and the revenge and the upset is humiliation. Because the purpose of violence, from my point of view, is to annihilate the human being, their culture, and their community. That's the purpose of mass violence. It's cultural annihilation. In Bosnia, they use, the Serbs use systematic rape to destroy whole villages. They go in a village, rape six people, the whole village was destroyed. You understand? It's within that culture, there was shame, stigma, terrible, right? The goal of violent acts, regardless of the intensity, is the same, to create the emotional state of humiliation. Now, think about this. During acts of violence, there is a complete absence of love, affection, and empathy. This is very important. And in the trauma stories of extreme violence, the feelings of humiliation is fully revealed, allowing us to achieve a complete appreciation of all of its dimensions. Next slide, yeah. Humiliation, if you don't mind me reading this, because it's a very subtle and important concept. Humiliation is a very complex human emotion because it's primarily linked to how people believe the world is viewing them, right? It is not clear-cut emotion like fear, but rather a state of being characterized by feelings of physical and mental inferiority, uncleanliness and shame, spiritual worthlessness and guilt. Many of my patients can't go to the mosque, can't go to church because they feel spiritually unworthy. And of moral repulsiveness to others, including God or higher being. The perpetrator uses humiliation, the tools of humiliation, to create the state of humiliation. Does that make sense? I hurt you through humiliation to create a humiliated person. And this is what we deal with every day in our clinic, with people who have been so humiliated, they're depressed, they can't function, and their lives are destroyed. Next slide. So when I want to, so with humiliation, I was talking to African-American colleagues and uh, the black Americans, and we were talking, and they go, you know, that's what we feel, you know, in our country. We feel humiliated a lot of times. We feel put down. We feel denigrated. You know, we feel... It, because the problem with humiliation is that above humiliation is anger, right? Revenge, hopelessness, and despair and depression. And that covers over the humiliation that's deep at a deeper level. So you gotta go deeper into the reality of the person, their experience of life, to find the humiliation. And then work with that humiliation to take them out of their traumatized self into a, a healed environment, okay? So it's a very long process sometimes, or sometimes very short. I had an Iraqi general who was my patient, who was tortured by Saddam Hussein, who came out of that beautifully, and this is a long story, but the way he came out of it is that we, he was on medication, he did better, and then finally we, we had one year discussion of the Gilgamesh epic. Anybody here read Gilgamesh? Yeah, you know, yeah, everybody here knows Gilgamesh, right? He, all, he was so humiliated, he was intellectual, he was brilliant. He was a college PhD or whatever. And he said, doctor, I don't want counseling. I want to talk to you about the great literature of my culture. That brought him out of his, you see? That brought, so I, I had to go read Gilgamesh again. I had read it since high school, right? And the Enuma Elish, everyone read the Enuma Elish, the Genesis story, right? I had to go back and read the ancient culture of Mesopotamia in order to work with this general because he was so highly educated, so intelligent, that's what he wanted. So we met every week, and he taught me, and I worked with him, and we had, and then finally at the end he said, you know, I'm cured, goodbye, and we, he left, he, was, he did great. It was a beautiful case of someone finding respect. And of course I always called him the general, you know why? Because I'm a doctor, he was a general, I never was a general. So I'd always say, General, he loved that. He goes, yes. I said, I said, you're a general. I have to call you general, not patient, general. He goes, okay. 
and I'll call you doctor. Yeah, so we had a great, uh, we had a great relationship. Yeah. So now let's talk about self-care. We'll go through these quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. When I was asked to write after 9-11, my book uh, about 9-11, this and the other thing, I was writing this book called Healing Invisible Wounds, and I didn't write a word about 9-11. I wrote about self-healing. I discovered in my writing that people healed themselves. The healing of the emotional wounds inflicted on mind and spirit by severe violence is also a natural process. Mind and body are powerfully linked from the molecular level. There's a lot of good science in this. From the molecular level to the thoughts and social behaviors of a person. Mind and body are similarly interrelated in their potent curative influence. After violence occurs, a self-healing process is immediately activated, transforming through physical and mental responses the damage that has occurred to the psychological and social self. You understand? So I use the model of wound healing for psychological healing as well. But we all know that violence, even if it's psychological, is also physical and also spiritual and also psychological. There, there is no, in the, you, they're probably teaching this now, you know, the body, the mind, and the spirit are one. There is no Cartesian duality anymore, right? We're one holistic human being in body, mind, and spirit. That's beautiful, right? And so when someone is really hurt psychologically, their body is also hurt physiologically, and we also know that, we'll talk about this in a minute, that they're set up for terrible chronic disease 20 years later. Next slide. Now, what are the major instruments of social healing, self-healing? This is from our research, many studies on this around resiliency, we call it resiliency. Altruism, work in school, and spirituality. These things form, of course, the social relationships are key. You know, in other words, people who have good social relationships are the most resilient, right? You know that, right? And people who help others, who work even in the crisis, go to his school even in the crisis, and have a spiritual meaning system, are resilient. So if you're, try these four things. These are self-healing mechanisms. There's been a huge amount of research on this. I, I don't want to go into that, but then resiliency. Does that make sense to people? They, used, they always say, if you want to help yourself, other people, help other people first, you know, altruism, right? This is a very, I've seen tremendous altruism in this country. It's wonderful, really. What I've seen in Becca Valley, etc. It's beautiful to see this altruism. You know. The next slide. This is a lot to read. I don't know why I have so many words on this slide, so no one can read it. You know. So let me. I got reading this. There's too many words. It's the Harvard rule of thumb is if you have more than ten words, you shouldn't show that slide. I don't know how this slide got made, but I made it. I confess. So anyway, so uh, what is health promotion? Uh, you're building on self-healing, right? You're building on self-healing. Who can tell you more about self-healing than the patient or the refugee because they're your teacher? So I always say to my refugee patients, you're my teacher, I'm your student, teach me. How are you healing yourself? They go into long hours. Oh, I go see my mother, have dinner. I never liked my mother, but now we get along fine and we're having dinner. You know, they tell long stories, you know, really about how they're healing their lives, you know. And then we build on that. Now, we, we have a, quite a well-known program of health promotion in our clinic because we have people 20, 30 years after the violence, you know. Probably you don't know this, but trauma plants the seed 20 years from now, of diabetes, heart disease, metabolic syndrome. You know, metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol, 
hypertension, things like this. We have a lot of research now that shows that highly traumatizing situations create over time serious life-threatening illnesses. It's not just psychological anymore. People in our combined community are dying in the 50s of diabetes and stroke. Is epidemic, and they went through the genocide under Pol Pot, right? So we try to head this off. In other words, you can take a refugee and their laboratory tests and their physical exam, everything is normal, but 20 years down the road, they may have a heart attack. So we build in health promotion. So we think that a key to public policy is that all traumatized people need health promotion. This is not coming down from Geneva, health promotion. But the primary care doctors here, they know this. You need to do health promotion, especially with young people, very young people, and teenagers. Right? Anybody here work with teenagers, right? Yeah. They're a lot of fun, right? They're troublemakers, but they're a lot of fun, right? And they really do great if you talk to them. I don't know if here in Lebanon, in our country, teenagers believe no one listens to them, right? You have that here in your country, the teenager thinks no one listens to them, you know? That they're invisible, right? No? You don't have that in Lebanon? Teenagers are tough, you know, right? Because they're so smart and they see everything. And of course, they get into trouble because they name everything, right? I don't know if they do that here, but they, they talk too much, you know? Because they, they, they say, oh, yeah, but okay. I say, Shh, don't say that, you know. So anyway, so let's go on past health promotion so we can open up for it. Ah, now we're finally with the Rabia. So we're very, we said, why are people living in tents, you know, expensive tents for four, in, in, in Haiti, five years after earthquake, 500,000 people still live in tents. Imagine this, 500,000 people after an earthquake where they spent $8 billion on that one island. They're still living in tents, okay. Now, the word habitat, I hope you guys can do this with your language, your Arabic beautiful language, you know, try to go back to the origins of words, right? I always go back to Latin, my Latin roots, right? The word habitat is derived from the Latin habitari, and in the ancient world meant the total environment in which a person or organism dwelt. And there was a belief, see, habitari, when you talk about habitat, habitari, there was a belief that there was a reciprocal relationship between the physical and natural environment and those living organisms who lived in that environment, i.e., a frog lives in a pond. The pond helps the frog, the frog helps the pond. That sounds like They're, they help each other. It's not just the frog or the fish living in the pond. That's an ecosystem in which there's a balance between the frog, the fish, the insects, and the pond. They're in harmony. So, uh, next slide. So here's the reality of temporary shelters. And here's a camp on the side from uh, Burma, from the, Burmi, the Rohingya refugees. Okay, this is an old slide. So we, Jim and I and our group, we go, our team, we go through the camps, you know, no privacy, the, the, it's freezing cold in the winter, it's raining in the, you know, it, it's terrible, right? Anyone live in a tent for four years in this room? You know, try it, you're not gonna like it, you know. Because there's lack of privacy, lack of private life, lack of space, durability, you, know, you can run through this whole list. I mean, it, it's a disaster, a human disaster. Same. Now, we know with the modern uh, architects like Rabia, you can put a solar panel on a tent and electrify that tent with a solar panel for $60. Can you imagine that? That you don't have to have a, t a camp where everyone lives in the dark, where women can't go to the toilet at night because they're sexually abused by putting up these solar panel lights. Where, where are they? Nowhere. 
you see, except in places like the Gaeta Project. So, so we, we were trying to find uh, somebody and someone who was trying to transform the habitat of refugees. And we found three great architects, Ribia, Cabello in Chile, and Sh Shigeri Bun in Japan. I won't talk about the other two because they're not here, and, uh, but Ribia is here. So I'll talk about him. He's very modest. He doesn't want me to talk about him, but I have to. So in the next slide, here's a garden. Do you know the research, you guys know the research on restorative environments and plants? Okay. If you're in a room, classroom, without any plants, and then how many people like go to classrooms or windows and stuff? Yeah, okay, so tomorrow bring in some plants because if you go into a room, my son did this at college room, because he taught me this. If you go into a room with plants, your academic performance goes up dramatically and your level of stress goes down. There's a lot of research on this, on what they call restorative environments. You understand? So here, there's lots of research coming out. This is like a great new field of um, ecology, psychology, science, primary health care. It's exciting, you know. So here's a Palestinian camp that he put plants in. So he went in an environment. Ruby, I went into an environment. How many years ago was that? Yes. Two years ago. I love this, this, these pictures. Where there were no plants and the place was depressing. So he said, you know, oh, here's the toilet bowl, it's not working, let's put plants on it. Here's a tub, it's out in the, throw it out in the garbage, let's fill it with tomatoes, you know. Oh, here's a roof here, let's put vines on the roof. Here's an example of, of this has an enormous impact on the health and well-being of people. Yeah, you see where I'm going with this? Okay, next slide. Now here are two happy workers of his, I don't know who they are, I didn't meet them, putting plants in the Palestinian camp. It's actually at the UV. And where did you get these pictures from? You sent it to me. During the course. Yeah, during the course. You know who these people are, right? Yeah, it's our graduates from the Department of Landscape Architecture. Actually, we tested this project in our uh, greenhouse on campus. So you guys are doing exciting work, restorative work. Okay, now, so my office, I have a little tiny office in, in my clinic, you know, trauma clinic. Based on Rubia's work, it's hard to get into my office now because the whole office is a jungle, you know. It's become a jungle. I mean, there's so many plants in there, and the patients have to push in, you know, and they sit there amongst all these plants, they go, Dr. Malik, I feel great. I love this office. This is like unbelievable office. It goes, really, they, plants are so nourishing to my patients, the torture survivors, right? From different backgrounds, Iraq, et cetera, you know. They love it. They love sitting with these nerds laughing at it, but it's true. So we, we, we got this from Rabia to like um, put as many plants as you can in your clinical office, you know. I had a guy at Harvard, one of my colleagues, a psychiatrist. He sat in the same office for 25 years treating schizophrenic patients, you know, psychotic patients, chronic, chronic illness, with a steel desk and a computer. That was it. And I would always wonder, like, who would see this guy? I mean, like, what's wrong with this picture? Something was wrong with that picture. Okay, now, the next slide. We're going to come back to this because I want to end in this month. Keep going. So with the Gata project, uh, I'm not going to go too much into it, uh, but we were given an award by the Kenny School, the Middle Eastern Initiative, to help study the work of the Gata project run by B and his colleagues here, you guys at AUB, to look at the impact of a built environment versus tents, you know, the tents, on school performance, emotional distress, depression, right, and uh, the reduction of uh, bullying and domestic violence and things like this, and to see whether or not the built environment is having impact on the young people in terms of better language, you know, better learning, 
less distress, et cetera. And also, any teachers here? Also, the built environment reduces burnout. You know the word burnout? You know, people get overwhelmed by the work and they're sad and depressed. You know, it reduces burnout in teachers too. We, were, we went, met with the Minister of Health today and, we were, and the Minister of uh, Mental Health. You know, the, I don't know if he's a minister, but the head of mental health for your country. And he was excited about this because they did analyses that showed high burnout in people working in these clinics. You know, a lot of distress, upset, etc. I just want to show you a few more things. So here's the gated environment, gated construction. Next slide. Here's a temporary, this is called uh, gated in your language is roof, right? Cover. 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 Sorry. Cover. Cover in temporary. Next slide. Uh, this was given permission, uh, this is not my picture, but from the GATA project, they, I had permission to show this. Next slide. Isn't that, this, does this look like a refugee camp to you? Ooh. It's beautiful. We were there, kids were crying and, and waiting a half an hour to get into the school. How much they liked the school. So think of the idea of you're traumatized, you're living in tents, you come to a school where you have less chaotic situation, you have some beauty, some peace and quiet in an environment. You see, this is the idea of restorative environment. So this is one element of the H5 model we're working on. Next slide. Here's the playground. Next slide. Okay, so if you want to go back, just for, keep going back to the circle. Okay, so uh, that's a quick review of the H5 model. Great, we have, I said I'd only speak to, for, till eight o'clock, so we can have plenty of discussion. And I finally, for our medical doctors here, um, uh, want to shift a little bit to our clinical model. So the H5 model is like our policy model. We're trying to, actually we're working with some people in Sweden to try to take a refugee camp. Uh, we haven't permission, haven't gotten permission to this, where we try to apply all, all elements of the H5 model for recovery of refugees. Because we think people who are highly traumatized should come into a restorative environment we call healing environment. Does that make sense? You know, your life's been shattered, you're depressed, you've lost everything. You should come into an environment that's restorative and doesn't make you worse, doesn't make you sicker. So I'm gonna stop with the H5 model, open this up for discussion in two minutes, because, but for the primary care doctors here, I wanna talk about our model of clinical care. So in every refugee environment, uh, there's a distribution curve, right? People very well, people okay, people not okay, and people very damaged, right? In our clinic in Boston, we care for the most damaged people because it's a clinic in Boston for refugees. So they come because they um, have severe post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, psychosis, diabetes, heart disease, they're very sick, okay? You have to have some place for people like that, right? So we're trying to work with the primary healthcare people here at AUB to, to be in the school system that will be mostly for healthy kids or kids who are, might be depressed, et cetera. But there will be a few people on the far end of that curve who are very, very, like severe bullying, severe domestic violence, or very depressed, or et cetera. So in our model, our clinical model, this is called complex care model. I know for most of the students, they want to understand this. Our model in primary health care has the following elements. Uh, our mental health work is always embedded in primary health care. So you see the three, you see primary health care on the side there, right? We base it on a new model in the United States called trauma-informed care. So trauma-informed care means that people who are in primary health care listen to the trauma story and have a model that has a sophisticated understanding 
of how trauma affects people's health and well-being. Okay, that's called trauma-informed care. Now, do you have this here, traditional healers, people in the community who do traditional healing? You do, right? Oh yeah, Whether, no matter what, religious background, etc. So we also work with traditional healers. In our clinic, we, for instance, uh, use a lot of Buddhist monks. Buddha, there are a lot of our patients are Buddhists and we work with the temple. Okay? In the center of this primary health care, trauma-informed care model, we have mental health, women's health, and chronic disease health promotion. See where I'm going with this? So, so we also have a focus on women's health, severe chronic disease like heart disease, diabetes, etc., and mental health. And then finally, we believe in every clinic, every primary health care clinic, there should be embedded within it education, like in the Rabia program, the primary health care program at Rabia, or work. You can't be a healthy person if you don't have a healthy job. Now, when I mean healthy job, I don't, I don't mean a toxic job where you're working like a slave, you're working 16 hours a day, you're not getting paid, you're pulling asbestos off the walls and you're getting lung disease. You understand what I'm saying? We're talking about a good, good job. And it could be on the farm, et cetera, but not a job that destroys. We have a lot of patients who work under the table. You have that term here? They work illegally and they do very dangerous jobs and they get hurt, you know. So this is a primary health care model that we have right here. This is our H, H -T model. I'm mostly sharing this for our doctors in the room, you know. I don't expect a lot of students to really fully appreciate that. So there it is. I think I lived up to my hour. You want to open it up for a discussion? And thank you very much for listening and appreciate it. I don't think we have a microphone, but uh, it's a small room and we can. There's a microphone. So we open up the floor for a few questions. Or comments. People want to make comments. Uh, Hello. Um, well, thank you. It was. Uh, I'm here. Right here. Except again. Yes. Hi. Hello. <laughs> thank you for uh, um, for your lecture and your presentation. Thank you for being here. And it's amazing that at seven o'clock you got a full room of students almost. Oh, so. Exciting. <laughs> um, I'm a faculty in the Faculty of Medicine in the Psychiatry Department. I'm a clinical psychologist. And um, as you know, we deal quite a bit with refugees. And, and what I have found from my own experience is that um, they have more than one trauma story. Um, there's, of course, the latest violence, you know, war-related trauma, but a lot of them come with other traumas from before, from their childhood, etc. So where, what do you focus on to start with? Do you go with what the patient wants? Um, and what if they don't get to the, you know, to all the traumas that they have suffered? Yeah, well, do you understand everybody? You know, in, in other words, um, say you're in a normal situation, you have child abuse as a child, right? And then you go through the war, et cetera. Yeah, that could be, yeah, I see, I, I think that we, um, we take the patient or the refugee where they're at right now. In other words, we start on the current situation. And um, as we work our way through that in counseling or you know, in our work, we eventually will end up discussing, um, we'll have like, uh, I've had patients who had child ab abuse, marital abuse, post-marital abuse, war abuse, and all lumped into a trauma story that they bring to us. And so it's a very, very difficult situation to work with, you know, but we do, we work with the whole thing, you know. But the, the patient will usually eventually reveal all of that, right? I mean, that's your experience, right? What's your experience? I mean, it seems to me that you have a lot of experience with this, yeah. Hello, eventually they do reveal everything. 
um, sometimes it's it's hard to know where, what to focus on. And as you said, maybe we need to focus on what the patient wants to start with initially. Uh, usually, yeah. And, you know, to provide as much relief as we can. Right. Thank you. Hey, the young people, oh yeah, here's a, someone here. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, lecture, it was very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in a concept that you just discussed, the uh, self-care, or care health, uh, I don't really remember right now, but it was about the patient like healing him or herself. I have two questions basically, knowing many people who went through traumas and not really, not mo I, I, I know some refugees but other have been through some other kind of uh, violations by regimes or some sort of that. Uh, first, uh, my first question is that the people I know usually uh, refuse to get help since they, it's really hard to relive everything. So is it possible for someone to heal him or herself uh, without uh, having to go through uh, psychological, uh, uh, with, the, with the psychologist or something? My second question uh, is that, um, how hard is it gonna be to uh, relive everything due to uh, to violations? So basically, uh, that's, that's a, well. The first question, the um, my own belief, my own experience is that um, people try to heal themselves, you know, in a very common sense way, you know, in their own cultural, social way, family way. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And then when it doesn't, that's where the psychologist or the social worker can come in or the doctor, you know, to provide the synergism to help that person move forward. You know, in other words, what they do might be great, but what they do with the doctor might be better and stronger and more powerful and more effective. The second comment is we, we don't... Uh, our model, and we've written a lot about this, and we have manuals, of this, et cetera, you know, is that we listen to the story once. We don't go over it and over it and over it. We don't believe in that, see, because uh, the, a lot of people can't bear telling this story to the doctor more than once, or the psychologist. You see what I'm saying? It's too painful. But they don't need to repeat and repeat. That's not the therapy. See, the therapy is, uh, we call this LUDA, listening, understanding, deep appreciation. In other words, we, we say two people, therapy is two people working together in a shared empathic partnership, partnership, to create a new worldview, not a disease cure worldview. So what we're saying is that we develop an empathic partnership and we work together to construct a new reality that's positive for the patient, for their family, their family, their children, their community, you know, and it works beautifully over time. Uh, we're not chasing after diagnoses with drugs. We don't do that and we're not constantly going over the trauma story, going, that hurts people. You know, there was a lot of research on debriefing, you know, the research on debriefing, you know, where uh, after 9-11, people ran down and they said, oh, tell us blow by blow what happened to you. And this debriefing made people sick. The research showed that this going over and over the trauma story, minutia by minutia, actually made people sick, sicker. So I don't know if that answers your question, you know, so you have to, but you can't, you can't get going unless you hear the story first, you know, because you have to have trust. In other words, like, you're my patient, I'm your doctor. How would I know where we're going if I don't know anything about you? But also, we tell our, our students, you know, it might take six months to a year before you tell me the whole story. So we say a little bit, a lot, over a long period of time. In other words, you can chip away at the trauma story. The primary care doctor, for instance, can hear two or three minutes every visit, and then at the end of the year, they know everything. 
They don't need to have a 90 minute interview. Does that answer, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you, it's a great, great question. So anybody, yeah, this, yeah. Yes, hi. Hello, my name is George. I'm a prospective uh, clinical traumatologist, hopefully. Uh, I have two questions, and the first one relates to uh, severe torture survivors. And I'm curious to see how your model addresses life after the camp and life after trauma. Uh, because so far we've discussed how the model addresses life within the camp. Uh, and the second question uh, is more about how the model addresses harm done to the integrity of the body. And what I mean by that is not necessarily just rape and assault. I mean things of the sort as amputations and physiological or biological trauma. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, the, the H5 model I was presenting was kind of a bottom-up policy model for the refugee camps. This model here, is our complex care model for torture survivors, you know. And so, so every, we have a lot of, we've treated many torture survivors resettled in Boston or in other countries. And the bottom line is we know, I mean, we're part of an international network of clinics that care for torture survivors, you know. And there's some in the Middle East, I think there's some in Jordan, right? Uh, in, uh, and one or two in Jordan now? Uh, there's one in Jordan, a torture treatment center, right? Yeah, there's one in Jordan. There's, uh, there's uh, one in Tunisia. We had the, last year the leader of the Tunisian Center for Victims of Torture came to our course uh, in, in, in Orvieto. And uh, we, we've had other people from around the world we work with. And it, you're right, there has to be a comprehensive medical care. So you... You have to deal with every medical aspect of the torture. Now, you know, for instance, like with sexual violence, gender-based violence, there's over 20 diagnoses associated, medical diagnoses associated with gender-based violence, right? Everything from uh, pelvic inflammatory disease through HIV AIDS and goes on and on. So we, we have a holistic approach. Like if you look at this approach here, if you're a torture survivor who's a woman, we have women. We, we focus on women's health. Right? If you're a torture survivor who has uh, chronic renal disease or an amputee or whatever, we focus on rehabilitation. Yeah, you know, so it's it's all integrated. We have to integrate that. Yeah, it's a lot of work, and it has to be quite comprehensive medically and psychologically, and rehabilitation is an important part of it. We use, a, just then, we use a lot of physical therapy, for instance, a lot of physical therapy, yeah, with our torture survivors. Yeah. Hi, um, so, uh, my name is Wajdi Hamisi, I'm a psychology student, senior year. And um, my question is actually going to go back a little bit um, to what you said related to moving to a tent. And it's also going to reflect on one of my courses from last semester with Professor uh, Tima, who happens to be here. And basically, like, if, if you're going to deal with the, um, someone who just lost everything, got their house destroyed, got um, everything lost in their life, and they have nothing and they're living in a tent, how are you going to... Where are you going to start from? Sometimes you would hear stories about people who have nothing. They lost their parents. They have, they're starting from scratch. I don't know, maybe they're 30 years old. They lost a leg. They lost family. They lost everything they've had. So how would you be able to tackle that and say everything's going to be better? You know? Well, first of all, we would never say everything's going to be better. I mean, that would be... And true. Let me give an example. Um, my son is murdered. Will I ever recover in my lifetime from that? No. Never. You'll never recover. But it doesn't mean that your life is destroyed, that you can't take care of your other children and have a productive life, you see. So we, we, we don't lie to patients or give them tell them stories that are not true, you know. Um, certain things 
you can. Uh, we know, for instance, the worst thing that could happen to someone is a disappeared a child or a disappeared relative. That's the worst. We would never say to a patient, oh, you'll get over it. They'll never get over it. So the day you die, be saying, I've had patients, the day they died, I've had patients 35 years, they're still looking for their son who disappeared under Pol Pot 35 years ago. Saying, but it doesn't mean you can't live a life, you can't be engaged in life, you see. Now, hopelessness, you're talking about hopelessness. Hopelessness is a dangerous area because the perpetrator wants you, the clinician, to feel hopeless. They pass that through the patient to the doctor. You understand? It's political. Hopelessness is political. You get what I'm saying? I don't give in to the perpetrator. I don't let the perpetrator destroy my confidence that there can be some healing in the patient. I say no to the perpetrator. This is political. The perpetrator wants everybody in this room to feel hopeless about the terrible things they've done to other human beings. That's their goal. That's a political goal. No? That's my analysis. You may not agree with it, but that's... And so I... Nobody's hopeless. And they do feel... But you have to confront. You have to deal with the hopelessness in people and take it on straight on. You know, you have to take it on straight on. You can't run away from it. But you can't promise um, things that are not true. Uh, the, I mean, does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, during the discussion, you raised the issue of uh, instruments for healing. Does technology have a role in healing? For example, the neurofeedback or similar tools which be, are based on technology to heal patients? Yeah, I, I think uh, three things on this. One is uh, tech, technology like neuroimaging, we, you know, we did... Um, Technology in terms of revealing diagnoses, we, we did a very important study we published in the top journal on brain disease caused by torture in Vietnamese political prisoners using neuroimaging. So te technology can reveal things that you cannot just see in a conversation, you know. So we do we do use neuroimaging at times, rarely, but we do we do use neurocognitive testing. Uh, we we use all the tools we can use to help us have a better understanding of the patient. Okay. The second thing is that EMDR. You guys know EMDR, you know, with the yeah. Uh, EMDR and these other technological things um, are. 80% of the people can respond to the trauma story narrative and basic psychotherapy. But EMDR and other things are very effective in certain cases. Uh, you, know, you know, you guys do virtual patient. Um, you put people in a hologram and they relive their, yeah. I mean, the, the, the military does that and, um, in our country. And uh, those things, exposure therapy, they call it exposure therapy. That's technology, you know, where you put someone in a machine and then they're back in uh, uh, the war re-experiencing. Yeah, and it's effective. It is effective for certain people. So yes, the, that can be effective in certain people who, are, who need it. And, um, and then finally, the, you guys have a health information technology unit here, you know, where you use uh, cell phones for medical exams and you do that, right? Yeah, and in other words, there's a lot of technology today for, like, for instance, with my patients, I can call them up at home. These are uh, people from rural areas who are health illiterate, who have cell phones, and I can do um, work with their hypertension and diabetes on the cell phone. They don't need to come to office, and in fact, I call them up once a week on the cell phone and talk to them. So yeah, technology is very important, and uh, but it has to be used um, in a wise way, though. Yeah. So I, we we do also use cell phone. You use cell phone technology for that? 
you're going to move there. Yeah. It does work, especially for hypertension and things like that, where there's, wherever there's poor compliance, you know, the cell phone is, uh, you can send a text every morning to a diabetic saying, you know, do your blood sugar, you know. It works. It really is very effective, yeah. Yes, there's a young man up there, yeah. One more question. Thank you, doctor, for this lecture. My question is, uh, like, technical, technically, how you have, like, lots of refugees, the number is very high. How do you choose which ones you need to work with? And uh, how is the, like, the work being funded? Uh, obviously, most of the work is for free and pro bono, but there are lots of stuff that you need, to, uh, you need money for it. So, basically, how do you get the money from? Thank you. Uh, as, as I was saying to Rabia, you know, uh, we got to find the mullah. You have that term in your country, mullah, your mullah, <laughs> you know. Where's the mullah, you know? Uh, two things. If you go into the field of human rights, here are young people here, right? Okay. You're not going to make a lot of money. Okay. That's reality number one, okay. You, you'll be, you no, know, I, I, I've been doing this work 40 years, and uh, I have to say it was, it's been a great career. I didn't make any money, but it's a great, wonderful career. Look, I hear, I'm, at my age, look, I'm in Lebanon talking to a wonderful group of people. I mean, who can beat that, right? Not too many of my colleagues are doing this, you know. So it's, um, there's a... Uh, we, <laughs> I'm going to answer it in a different way for young people, is that you, do you have this concept in your country of a calling, a vocation, you know, a vocation, like you're called by whoever, you know, and you follow that calling, you know. So I say to young people, you know, do something you love, that you're passionate about, you know, that means something to you. And you'll have a good life, you know. You'll, you'll love your life. You'll have a good life, you know. But along the way, you will have pushback. People will try to stop you. They won't give you money. They'll try to hurt you, etc. you know. And you have to understand that that's the um, challenge of um, following your passion. And I think... Um, and I also, we have young people here, Megan and Nora, you can talk to them. I mean, Nora's in a lot of trouble because she's been following a passion because we helped, helped her develop her passion. And okay, we take credit for it, but uh, getting her in trouble. But you know, the, um, the important thing is, um, it's just a tremendous amount of satisfaction. I mean, my father used to say to me, he was a tiny immigrant, he said, son, take on a problem you can't solve. You'll never be bored a day in your life. And what he meant by that is, um, take on a big problem. Why waste your life on, little, on peanuts? Yeah, you know, little problems. But what he also meant by that, and I think it's very important for young people to understand, is that when you take on a big problem, you're gonna fail, and you're going to fail, and you're going to fail is good. Failure is good because when you're taking on a big problem, you can't, if you, we know this around people who do innovation and like in Silicon Valley and stuff, they all say the same thing. Try the big idea, you fail. Hey, now you, next time you're around, you make money. See, you have to incorporate in your life the concept of failure. Failure is good. Imperfection is good, you know, because then out of that you develop the next level and then you keep getting better and better. And so I think it's pretty, pretty exciting to, um, to, to I, I, I'm proud of our career, you know, because we, Jim and I and our team, the young people here, you know, they, we've done a lot of good in the world. We're proud of that, you know. Around money, I, you got to ask Rabia about that because I'm not a businessman, you know, so I can't, uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we have a, do you have the saying at AUB, at Harvard, we have a saying, every tub on its own bottom. You know that saying? Every tub on its own bottom. 
means don't ask Harvard for money. <laughs> Even though they got a lot of moolah, you know. They have a lot, Harvard has a lot of moolah, so. I, I didn't answer your question. I, I took a sideshow right there. <laughs> I didn't answer your question right Hello, I have two questions for you, actually. Uh, my first is, you mentioned that these acts of violence and acts of war also are acts of humiliation. A lot of times, a lot of our clients see the very act of coming to therapy. I'm a clinical psychologist. Yeah. Uh, they see coming to therapy as another act of humiliation. How do we help them manage this belief and deal with that? And then my other question is, I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more about, you mentioned work and school and altruism, um, as helping individuals recover. My thought is that it's basically uh, the routines and consistency and also having a sense of purpose and value and worth. Hey, absolutely. Those are the, yeah. So I'm wondering if those are the factors and if there are other factors involved as well that are helping the recovery process How do you, along. Right. You all know that um, for any, maybe not in Lebanon, but in the United States, you know, for the mainstream American citizen, if you send them to psychiatry, is high stigma, you know. You don't have, do you have that here stigma? And if you said, oh, by the way, Rabia, go see a psychiatrist, it would be stigmatizing to him and his family and his community, you know? So, so do you have that here? I mean, do people feel stigmatized? But what? Or here. Or here, yeah. And we know, we have um, a lot of people from the Middle East as patients in America. We have a lot of people from Southeast Asia. They have high stigma. And the way we got around this, this doesn't answer your question um, really, but uh, the way we got around it is we built, um, we've always been in primary care medicine because patients, no matter where they're from, even if they didn't have family doctors, they love their family doctor. The most popular person in medicine on the planet Earth is the family doctor. Let's be honest, you know, right? People love their family doctors, right? So they don't feel stigmatized when they come to our clinic, that's a mental health clinic, in primary health care, they feel that's part of primary health care and family medicine. So for 35 years, right Jim, we've had a close relationship with primary health care for 35 years. We have in our clinic a 95% compliance rate of poor people coming, 95% show up on time. Can you imagine that? They love coming. I've tried to get to cancel some of my pages. I try, you know, I'll say, oh, you don't need to come anymore. And they go like this, you don't like me? I go, no, no, you're doing better. You don't want, you, you know, you don't care about me anymore? Okay, you can come. No, I'm serious. It, 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 because when people get over the stigma, they really develop a deep, deep attachment. You know this to the therapist. They love their therapist. I mean, even though they think they have no clue I'm a psychiatrist. <clears throat> they, they don't care. Once you get past that stigma, so you have to create an entryway in, like with the GATA project, you have to create an entryway in that we're trying to, that's not, doesn't have the word stigma on it. You know, does that make sense to you? Yeah, and it works. It works beautifully. I mean, I'll have patients come to me. Here's another example. A Cambodian patient will come and say, oh, everybody in my community tells me, this is interesting, says, uh, my, your medication is going to make me crazy. Chukut, they call it chukut, you know. So I stopped taking it. Oh, oh, okay, people in your community say, my medication is going to make you crazy, so I'm going to stop taking it. Now, if you had a car uh, that was broken, would you take it to a, a, a beautician or a hair salon? They go, no, why would I do that? What the heck do they know about a car? Does your friend, a doctor, does he know about medicine? No, that guy doesn't know a thing about medicine. So you listen to him about the fact that the medication is going to make you crazy. They go, you're right, I'm not going to listen anymore. See, because the community will push back on the person and attack them. Do you have that here? 
Yeah, they, in other words, a patient will say, what are you, crazy? You're going to psychiatry? The medication's going to, you know, what are you, nuts? You're a nut job, you know? I don't know if you use words like that, but, you know, something similar, you know? So we, we talk to the patient about that, and we say, well, don't ask your hairdresser how to fix your car. I'm your doctor. Yeah, you're my doctor. You trust me? Yeah, I trust Okay, let's go. That's how it works, you know. And the... Okay, yeah, good. last question. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I have to, actually one thought to share and one question no, to ask. Share your thoughts, it's great. Um, I, ha I work at Restart Center. I don't know if you happen to hear about it. It's uh, a center for, it's for rehabilitation for victims of war and torture. And I'm very proud to be part of this institution uh, because um, basically we are on the front lines. Uh, in many cases, we see hundreds of patients, uh, hundred, really hundreds of patients come to the clinic every day. And since you were talking that your model is a bottom-up model, I thought I'd like to share uh, an experience that we found out in, yeah, please, in yeah. our, uh, our workplace. Uh, one of the main sources of strength and uh, protective factors that we found, and we've been really investing in that, is uh, family uh, relationships, because after war, after trauma, the whole family shatters. Children don't even recognize their parents anymore. The parents don't know how they're, they are anymore. And uh, there's a lot of isolation. So the more we realized we worked with the families and the more we managed to connect uh, the refugees with similar populations, because I happen to work a lot with sexual minority uh, population uh, within the refugee population and of course they lost their families by default they're persecuted by their families so um, we, we tried as much as we can to connect people um, within the community itself within their families within the bigger image so we always find in our clinic uh, they're they're sitting there they they get to know each other we, it's always full with people chatting having coffee and water i don't know what they did. And I think it, ha it has been a very uh, powerful f source that we, we even, we're currently uh, inventing our own family therapy model, which is very different from all family therapy models, based on this bottom-up idea. Yeah. Um, so this is something I thought I'd share with you because I didn't see it um, um, in your model. I, I don't know, I just thought it, it might be helpful maybe. My question, um, we suffer a lot uh, at Restart from burnout. This is something uh, we feel it's a very common problem among our staff. Uh, we feel, uh, you know, we, we, there's little we can do. I mean, the models are, are great. Even the ones we follow are theoretically perfect, but we don't have the funds for them. We don't, uh, um, we can't do uh, what's there. I'm listening to okay. him. Just, yeah. Yeah, listening. Um, so this is a, some, currently what we try to do is um, to have like a group talk within the staff, um, debriefing where someone would lead the group and some the therapist would talk because really we reach to burnout levels that are remarkable. Right. Um, it's really difficult to do therapy when someone is right in front of you telling you that he's hungry. We have therapists who didn't even uh, who brought food to their patients. It's it's that sometimes it gets that bad. So I don't know what, given your experience, how, what, how, do you, how do you advise us in this direction? How do we deal uh, with our members? And I'm going to have Jim uh, speak. Let me, first of all, let me say you're absolutely correct. We should have here uh, in the H5 model um, social network, the family social network is a key to resiliency. In fact, all, all the research shows it's the main key is your social family network, is the, the glue to res people being resilient. I'm going to add that, you know. So I appreciate you for finding that gap, you know. I did say it, but it's not a slide. And then Jim, uh, who, our co-founder, who's an expert on burnout, I thought maybe you can respond to her work with burnout, you know. Yeah, this is, uh, in the field, this is uh, pervasive. And so in our clinic, um, in the last year or two, the administration has been pushing the staff to work more, see more patients. And there's been a reduction of uh, what we call ongoing supervision and support. And so um, our motto is take care of yourself first. If you don't, if you don't take care of yourself, 
you don't have any business taking care of anyone else. So family first, and there's a lot of self-care techniques, and there's a lot of words, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, you know all these uh, things that uh, are in, uh, have been studied. Uh, so so um, we use like, a, um, I don't know if you know the work of Michael Ballant, Michael Ballant was a, a psychoanalyst from Hungary, and uh, he invented Ballant groups for primary care doctors. And uh, uh, back uh, around World War II. So we took that model, we got to know the Ballant Society guys in London, and we started using that with multidiscipline psychologists, social workers, uh, uh, psychiatry, uh, primary care doctors, uh, family medical doctors, um, so what we did in our clinic was we just said every Tuesday at lunch, everybody wants to come and talk about cases, just bring your lunch. Uh, and so everybody just rebuilt in the clinic. They pushed back. They can't. So now on Tuesday, uh, the, the, the conference room is full with uh, clinical people. And we just say, uh, does anybody have a case? And we don't talk about medication or techniques or anything. We talk about the relationship between the therapist and the family and the, uh, the patient and their family and the community. Uh, and so oftentimes around the table, because you're, you have the primary care doctor there, just there, you have the case manager there, it's a good way to get organized around uh, like what's, what's the uh, treatment plan. Where, where, where's everybody going? So just by talking about one case, the people who are listening to that discussion are also benefiting. Um, so this is a, a recommendation I would make to you and your team. Like uh, another, another thought would be um, occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, take a day off. Go off to a, a, an ideal place and uh, have a retreat. You know, do, uh, just uh, some reflection on, on, on things like this, just, just to acknowledge it. Um, and uh, I guess uh, for some, for some therap therapists, if they need therapy, they can go and find therapy for themselves to help them do their work. Um, um, so um, if this, this work is not for everybody. You, you have to kind of have the right personality. It's not something you can learn in the book. So if, you, if you're in this work and you find that it's not for you, why don't you check out and get another uh, job or a career? <laughs> now that would that, 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 be another uh, strong recommendation I'd take. Because if you're going to do this work, I'd say be a committed uh, social worker, be a committed doctor, be a committed uh, therapist. There's, there's another point too. Going back to the Rabia's work, you know, uh, the balance. You you should start your balance groups. They're great, wonderful, and they're very um, uh, wonderful for for dealing with burnout. You know, how do you spell balance? B a l b a l i e n t. Yeah, look it up because you'll find it's a fantastic contribution to your work. But also look at your environment again as a restorative environment we we have in our course in Italy every doctor social worker clinician torturous treatment provider does a healing environment on their work and you can also do an analysis of where you work in terms of do you work in a restorative environment like in my office in our clinic we have beautiful uh, things brought in by the patients. We have plants everywhere. In, in, in other words, don't don't work in an austere, extreme environment. You know, br bring beauty because we have a saying in our clinic. You know, is no healing without beauty. We really believe this. And you know, when you bring beauty into your work and into your life and into the life of the patient, it's very therapeutic. You know. You know and so I think Rabia's. Uh, Rabia's work is a great example of people, uh, what do they say in architecture, form versus function, right? You know the function versus form, form versus function? You know? 
is that he um, works on, fun in other words, he wants to have a restorative environment, then he creates the form to create that. And you, you know, we don't think as clinicians, as architects, or, you know, in other words, we're, we're not, this is my new passion, is the built environment, you know. Arabia actually converted to me this three years ago, you know, and uh, <clears throat> wherever I go, um, if I see an empty tomato can, you know, I'll put a plant in it, you know. No, I'm serious. I've become a fanatic, a Rabia fanatic, you know, because I, <laughs> I, uh, I can't stand to see something that can have a plant not have a plant. So I put plants everywhere now. And you tell you the truth, I feel great. It's really, it's everybody in the class, right? Everybody feels better. My son was in a classroom. I don't know if you have this. He was in a classroom at Northeastern in biology. There's no windows, no plants, just chairs in the room. And he was studying Rabia's work. And he goes, Dad, he goes, I can't stand this classroom. There's no plants. There's no light. There's not. So the next week, he brought in five plants, and all the patient, all the students felt better. No, I'm serious. It had an impact on the students. You know. And we will end at this note, no healing without beauty. The, the last thing I want to say before we end is, uh, Richard's demonstrated throughout the lecture and the discussion the importance of a sense of humor. Uh, there's been a lot of laughter in the room. So in your clinic, uh, take it down a thousand and try to not be so serious, okay? And tell some jokes. That's right. Okay. So that's, that's my advice. Thank you so much for a beautiful event. Thank you all for attending. We're over them an hour and a half. Thank you so much, Richard. <laughs> Take the data, Basil. That's a bad Take it down a thousand.